we come now uh, this morning to the last uh, great account, and it's the account of the family of Jacob that brings to conclusion the whole story of uh, Genesis in many ways. And so it encapsulates a revelation of the Son. And it <clears throat> uh, also uh, 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 pictures for us the blessing upon that one who's been chosen in the land. And it will pick up the, the great themes of Revelation through the whole book all the way from the beginning and the putting of a man in that garden that reflects God's image and uh, all the way that God will restore and bring to fulfillment that purpose of the blessing upon that image in that land. See? So uh, let's get into this whole story, and as we do, let me uh, pray for us. Father, once again, we bow our hearts in your presence, and we uh, yield our minds and our wills in our hearts, in, in all that you want to say to us through this story this morning. Lord, may we hear your voice, and may we respond to all that you want to say to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is the great uh, seventh story now of the whole book. We're getting the picture of the son that's coming and how he will come. When you look more uh, detailed at the patriarchal stories in particular, these are large stories. One thing that characterizes the, 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 the structure to the story and how it's told is that it opens with this uh, destiny statement of uh, what God intends to do to bring to fulfillment his purpose through that descendant and his family. So you got the destiny statement of Genesis 12, 1 through 3. You got the destiny statement of the, the, the family of Isaac and the struggle between his two, two sons. And then you, this morning we're going to get into the destiny statement of Jacob uh, and his sons. The other thing that's very characteristic about the story is that that destiny, that purpose that God is going to fulfill and how it will be fulfilled is disclosed in this patriarchal story. And there's a journey. For Abraham, it's a journey of faith. He's pregnant with the promise of a son that will become a great nation, nations, he will actually be a father of nations, and it's going to be a blessing that will go through him and his descendants to all the nations of the earth. And the whole earth will be sanctified through the image of the Son, through that process. But how that will happen, how will God fulfill that? The patriarchal story is disclosing the means by which that will happen. And at the center of every patriarchal story is a great turning point, and it's a great struggle between a human means and a God-provided means. And God is choosing to bring all this to fulfillment through human impossibility. You will know it's been done by grace. This was God's doing. This was not man's effort. Man has no capacity to, de to determine their own destiny. They can attempt it, as they did at Babel, but it will not be the design in God's creation for man to seek to determine his own destiny. He's called into the destiny that God is seeking to fulfill. So you've got this straight, great struggle between Hagar and Sarah. You've got the great struggle between Leah and Rachel. And now we come to the, to the, to the last story here, and it, and it seems to be that it's told with two major parts. And the, this 
opening part really has to do with the son or the king's servants in the land. Is it the center of it? And we'll look at this. The second part to the story has more to do with the blessing on the sons in the land. So this is a great culmination to the whole theme of the whole book of Genesis. So this morning, for sake of time, all we can really do is look at, uh, at this opening one. And I'll leave this one for you uh, to look at yourself. <clears throat> now, one thing we got to just keep in focus that we uh, referred to last week, that the story last week and the story of Jacob and this great struggle that happened at the very center of the story between Jacob's two wives, Leah and Rachel, God brought forth in the midst of Rachel's barrenness, she brought forth a son, and this son was given the name Joseph. God remembered her. She brought forth a son. He, she named him Joseph, which means one more is coming. It's kind of a prophetic uh, uh, disclosure in the name uh, regarding what God is up to. At the end of her life, she brought forth a, a, another son, and he was named by Rachel Benoni. Benoni means son of trouble. But Jacob said, No, his name will not be Benoni, ben uh, it will be Benjamin. Benjamin means son of my right hand. That is a son of rulership. And so you got the idea here, even in the two sons that are born to Rachel, one is pointing to one that's coming, and another is pointing to one who's at the right hand of the father. Okay. So this is prophetic. This launches us now into the story, and you will see in the story that we get into this morning, Joseph and Benjamin and their relationship to the father is very, very significant, and it's key in the story. Okay, so this is the backdrop to that. Now, <clears throat> this first part to the story, part one, this is the text we'll, we'll focus on this morning. If you were to divide it up into its natural units, this is what you see, I think, in terms of the breakdown of the story. Very briefly, it opens with two dreams. They're prophetic words of destiny that disclose God's purpose through the descendants of Jacob. One in particular, Joseph, in relationship to his, the rest of the family. Then there is a unit of the story that deals with the brother's rejection of Joseph. And he's sold for silver into Egypt. And then there's an insertion of a story, and you, you wonder why does the author focus on this son Judah, and he separated himself from his brothers, and you got this story, and, and it's quite an uh, intriguing story about Judah and what happened through his three sons in relationship to their wives. And it has to do with Gentiles, particularly one Gentile wife. And it's got prostitution and everything else in the story. And it just, it's a, it, you wonder, why in the world is that there? But the key is that it has to do with Gentiles. In every patriarchal story, there's something that is in the story that has to do with the blessed nation, and particularly here, Judah, in, and their relationship with Gentiles. And over and over again, it's a story of failure, a, fo a failure to be a steward of blessing in relationship to Gentiles. This is prophetic for the whole biblical story. Israel will fail over and over again in terms of her stewardship and relationship to the nations. 
Then it goes back and it picks up what happened to Joseph when he got back into to, uh, um, uh, Egypt, when he was taken into Egypt, sold for silver, taken into Egypt. He, 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 uh, he, he's uh, uh, put in Potiphar's house and he's put in charge. Rulership theme again. And then you got the center of the story and it's two dreams and it has to do with death and resurrection on the third day. And then you've got two more dreams. It has to do with plenty and drought on the land and stewardship of rulership in the wisdom of God from heaven on the land and the blessing of nations. This is showing you the means, the way God will bring about this destiny. Actually, the whole, all of this is showing you the means. And then the story begins to reverse itself. You'll find that the next part to the story, Joseph's put in charge now, not in Potiphar's house, but in Pharaoh's house. And then Joseph extends blessing to nations. This is in parallel with this, where he withheld blessing from Gentiles. And then he picks up this great story of the brothers, and now they're welcomed by Joseph, the one they sold into Egypt. And you've got a great reversal of what happened here. And then at the very end, you've got two revelations where the great I am statements, I am Joseph. I am Joseph, your brother. <laughs> and... Uh, it brings to conclusion this, uh, this uh, first half to the story. But there's the structure. The structure helps us focus on key things and their parallel. And in the midst of the parallel and the key themes, a great reversal is going to happen. And how and why it happens is disclosing gospel for us. Okay? okay? So let's get into this. Uh, oh, this is the second part to the story. I'll have this in your notes. Uh, the center to the second part to the story has the blessing that Jacob gives to his sons. And it has to do with prophetic blessing that's going to be stewarded through Ephraim and Manasseh. And interestingly, the second is chosen over the first, which has been the case in every patriarchal story. And then the blessing that Jacob gives to all his 12 sons and the future destiny that they will have. One in particular, Judah, who will rule. And it picks up the theme then of Judah and how he relates to Joseph uh, in the story. So that's the second thing. We won't focus on this for sake of time. Okay, now let's, get, let's begin with the opening destiny statements of the uh, uh, sons of Jacob. It opens with these two dreams that Joseph has. Now imagine, he's 17 years old. This story is going to cover 20-some years, probably, at least, in Joseph's life. These are very specific chapters in his story, but it begins with this one. And if you can imagine being 17 years old, the dynamics in the family are that, that Joseph is highly loved by his father, and he's been given an ornament, an, uh, an ornamented robe, a richly ornamented robe. That's, that's significant. The father's bestowal of a very richly ornamented robe upon Joseph. But his brothers see their father's love for Joseph and they hate him. And this is going to start bringing out the dynamic between brothers in this family. And the, the hate that is there because one is highly favored and the others in relationship to that respond with hate. It takes you all the way back to the beginning of Genesis, Cain and Abel. 
Then it says, Joseph had a dream. He told it to his brothers, and they hated him all the more. And the dream had to do with 12, uh, 11 stalks of grain that were all bowed down to one. And that one stood upright. The question that arose from the dream in, in the response of the brothers, do you intend to reign over us? Do you intend to rule over us? And it's left unanswered. Then comes the second dream. He told it to his brothers. When he told, and, and then it even it was told to his father, as well as his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will you... Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? And this is the dream of the sun and the stars and the moon all bowed down to one. And now he says, will your mother, will I, your mother and your sons all bow down to you? So here you got fruit, the fruit of the land. And here you got the heavens, the heavens and the earth, all bowing down to one. Mm. And the question is, are you going to rule over us? It's pregnant with destiny of Joseph. But how will that rulership come about, see, is going to be very, very key in the story. How will God fulfill that? So as you know, the, sec the next second part now to the story shows you a little journey. And this story is full of journey. And you begin to follow the characters in the journey and what happens on this journey, and you'll be drawn into the heart of what's being revealed. It says that the, the uh, uh, now... Um, uh, that uh, Jacob uh, wanted to find out about his brothers, so he sent Joseph to go to his brothers and find out about their welfare. So here is Joseph with his robe, the one in the father's love being sent. And he's being sent to find out about the welfare of the brothers. Then you find here in uh, chapter 37, verse 19, what begins to happen when Joseph arrives and finds his brothers. When they saw him in the distance, they began to, to, they began to plot as to how they would kill him. Now the hate has become, let's kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and then say that a ferocious animal has devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Now, in Scripture, you always want to really perk up when it says, come, let us. There's a great contrast between two streams of mankind. Mankind, where one says, come, let us make, let us do, let us. The other one says, it comes from heaven, I will make, I will do. Okay? Here's man, come, let us kill him. Let's kill him and then throw him into a cistern and then say, Notice, our words can cover up our actions. Let's say a ferocious animal has killed him. Who will know? So guilt is going to be covered with words. This is the plan. Now, it's interesting in the story that when... Uh, 
Reuben. Reuben now is the firstborn of Jacob. When Reuben heard this plan, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the desert, but don't lay a hand on him. And Reuben said this to rescue him. I'm sure he thought in his mind, if we throw him into a cistern without any water, I'll come back and I'll get him out. Firstborn attempts to rescue. Hold on to that. When Joseph's brothers came and they stripped him then of his robe, that's kind of an a emphasized statement in the text, stripped him of his robe, the richly ornamented robe, restated for emphasis. They took him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty and there was no water in it. So then they were sitting down at a meal and they see these uh, Midianites come. And now Judah rises and there's a contrast in this story all the time between Reuben's attempt to save and Judah's attempt to save. One never succeeds, Judah's does. And this is an important theme in the story here. Judah says, come, when they, when they see the Midianites, come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. There's the come, let us again. Not lay a hand on him. After all, he's our brother, our own flesh and blood. Uh, what will we gain if we do that? So you got this idea of if we sell him, we'll gain something. If we don't, what do we, what do we gain? See, if we just kill him. So here's an interesting little plan on the part of Judah, let's sell him, and then we'll gain something. Okay, so the Midianites uh, buy uh, Joseph. He's sold for silver, 20 shekels of silver, to the Ishmaelites, and they took him to Egypt. Meanwhile, Reuben must not have been there when this plan was made, and Reuben comes, he returns, and he sees that Joseph is no longer in the cistern, and he tears his robes. And he goes to his brothers, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? And then they had gotten Joseph's robe, and they dipped it in blood, and they brought that and, uh, 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 to, to, uh, to Reuben, and they took the ornamented robe then to their father. And then they say these words, We found this. Examine it to see whether it's your son's robe. And the father recognized it was the son's robe. Reuben has been deceived, most likely, thinking that his brother has been torn to shreds by some wild animal. Now, do you, do, you, do you begin to feel the drama that is emerging? This is going to be very, very sad. Silver and Judah and Reuben and relationship to the father. A robe, a richly ornamented robe dipped in blood to cover their sin. And it will be taken to the father. The father, when he sees that, he tears his robes, tore his clothes, put on a sackcloth, mourned for his son for many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, in mourning I will go down to the grave to my son. And his father wept. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him into Egypt, took him to Egypt. Okay. Next unit to the story. This whole thing of Judah withholding blessing.
from Gentile. Judah had left his brothers, gone off. He had three sons. Two of those sons died. When one son dies, the wife of the other, uh, the, the other son will take his wife as a common cultural practice. But then the second son dies, and that wife is left without a husband. And then Judah says, well, my third son, my youngest, when he grows up, he will be given to Tamar. But when he grew up, he did not give him to Tamar. So Tamar had a scheme. When Judah was going to uh, shear his flock, or he was going someplace, and she decided, I will go and play the prostitute in relationship to my father-in-law. Imagine. And uh, Judah comes walking along, sees a prostitute, wants to, uh, to go with her, and uh, Tamar, the prostitute, says, give me a sign and a pledge of payment and a, and a seal. It's a symbol of his authority. And his staff is given to Tamar. Pretty soon, people learn that um, uh, Tamar is pregnant. And Judah hears about that and says she ought to be put to death. He didn't know it was... Uh, no, uh, he, uh, he didn't know the prostitute was Tamar, see? She had to be put to death. And then Tamar says, well, whoever is the owner of this seal and this staff, who is the owner of this? It's Judah. And this great, <laughs> it's, a, it's an amazing story. Uh, Judah ends up making a confession, and this is very, very significant. She's more righteous than I. Mm. This is a theme you found with Abimelech in relationship to Isaac. Abimelech was more righteous than Isaac, the Israelite. The same way in Egypt with Abraham. Pharaoh was more righteous than Abraham. So hold on to that in relationship to the blessed nation in relationship to Gentiles. See, it's a great picture of failure in terms of stewardship of blessing. Judah is actually found seeking to withhold blessing. He did not give his younger son to Tamar. Withholding blessing. So a great note of, of failure. It will be reversed in Joseph when he extends blessing to Gentiles. Okay, but let's follow the story now. You go into Egypt. It says when uh, Joseph is taken into Egypt and he is in the house of Potiphar, Potiphar recognizes the blessing upon Joseph and his whole household because of Joseph's presence in his house. That is a great theme. And so it leads to rulership in the house. Potiphar entrusts the whole house to Joseph. Blessing associated with rulership. Favor is upon him. And then Potiphar's wife seeks to seduce Joseph. And you remember the story? Uh... Uh, she, she made several attempts, and then finally she actually grabbed hold of him, and at that point Joseph uh, 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 broke loose from his robe, from his, from his uh, cloak or whatever it was, and uh, left the house, fled from her. When Potiphar comes back, now Potiphar's wife changes the whole story and says, he tried to seduce me. And he's, she's, she's, she's taken that robe, and she has put it by her side. And it's interesting in the text, the word put there is exactly the same word that is used 
and it's used very, very rarely, but it's the word that was used when man, in the image of God, was put in the garden. There is a priestly testimony that is associated with that pudding, but here it's used to give false testimony in the eyes of Potiphar. Corruption at the core, see, in this. And so it leads to Potiphar putting Joseph in prison. And in prison, uh, and we get now to the, the center of the story here, in prison, Joseph again finds favor in the eyes of the prison guard. Again, the, 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 the favor that rests upon somebody with the blessing of God upon them. And this leads then to Joseph being put in charge of the prison. Rulership. Now in prison. What does this say to us? If the favor and the blessing upon us of God is upon us, probably any situation, no, you shouldn't say probably, any situation God puts us into, we have the capacity to fulfill and steward that blessing in relationship to others, whether friend or foe. Okay? This is a great uh, picture of what God does through people in a corrupt world. If I had time, oh, I'd tell you a story about a prisoner story in India of how these people that had the impact of the cross of Christ and the power that delivers people from sin and it transformed 60 prisoners who were under life sentence and they were took back into the prisons and they brought blessing to those prisons. Wow. It's amazing. American teams came and they heard the blessing of what had happened in those prisons. So this is happening with Joseph. Then in the prison, there are two servants of the king that are brought into the prison because they are they 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 violated something. They and so the 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 Pharaoh has has put them in the prison with Joseph. Now it's very, very interesting. In the prison, what happens? You know the story? These two Servants of the king now have dreams. One has a dream, and it has to do with a vine that has three branches, and uh, uh, off those branches there is a cluster of grapes, and uh, he takes hold of that cluster and squeezes the wine from the or the, the juice out of the grape and uh, gives it in the cup to the king. One dream. Vine, grapes, juice. The second dream has to do with uh, the, the, the servant of the king who's carrying a basket with three, three baskets of bread on his hand. Notice the idea here of uh, wine and bread. And three. Within three days. Three days. The symbol of the bread is three days. Uh, and these two now wonder, what is the meaning of these dreams. These dreams are disclosing the future destiny of the king's servants. When Joseph hears these dreams, uh, he, he said, do, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. And Joseph hears the dream. And then Joseph gives heavenly wisdom that interprets the meaning of these dreams. And it's interesting that this one, the one with the vine, he says, within three days, you, the servant of the king, 
your head is going to be lifted up in the eyes of the king. And there's a play on this word, lift up. The second one, the one with the bread, your head is going to be lifted off in three days. So you've got lifting up and lifting off. And it's going to happen on the third day. Death and resurrection, so to speak, on the third day. Is that prophetic destiny of the future of a king's servant? (coughs) Then comes the second dream. Well, no. Then it says, when this guy heard the positive report, (laughs) this guy wanted to hear his. And then, after Joseph interprets the two dreams, this guy says, or Joseph says to this guy, now when your head is lifted up, remember me. Remember me in the eyes of Pharaoh. But it says that after this, this, this one was lifted up and taken out of prison, it says that he did not remember. In fact, it emphasized in the text, he was forgotten. Joseph is forgotten. Two whole years pass by. And then comes Pharaoh having dreams. He has two dreams. Notice in all of this, two dreams, two dreams, two dreams. And there's going to be two revelations here. Why two? Well, here you find out why two in this one. There's two dreams that Pharaoh has. And they're pictures of... Down by the Nile, this would be the place where worship uh, would take place. And there are seven sleek and fat cows that come up out of the Nile. And then it's followed by seven gaunt, skinny uh, cows that come up out of the Nile. And they eat, they swallow the seven fat cows, but they end up looking still gaunt. Interesting. Then he has a second dream, and it's a picture of a healthy stock of grain, seven healthy stocks of grain, and then followed by seven very thin, scorched by the east wind, Uh, stocks of grain, and these stocks of grain swallow up the healthy good ones, eat up. I don't know how that happened, I don't know. It can happen in a dream, I guess. (laughs) Now, what does this mean? Notice this all has to do then with the the seven, and it says... Pharaoh, after he's had these dreams, he calls all the magicians and the wise men of Egypt and tell him to come and interpret them for him. And as you know, at this point, that servant whose head was lifted up remembers Joseph in prison. Says, oh, I forgot. I now remember. There's a guy in the prison who can interpret dreams. And Joseph is brought out. He comes before Pharaoh and says, I can't interpret dreams dreams, but God can, and he gets wisdom from heaven to interpret these dreams, saying there's going to be seven years of plenty in the land, and then it's going to be followed by seven years of great drought. And then here's what you should do with that wisdom from heaven in terms of rulership in the land. You need to store up during the seven years so that you can distribute during the the, uh, famine years. And then Pharaoh says, oh man, Can we find anyone wiser than this man who gets wisdom from heaven? And he puts uh, Joseph in charge of the land. So there's two great significant dreams regarding the means by which the blessing will be fulfilled through person and land 
in the whole story. See? So Joseph is put in, jo in charge of Potiphar's house, and he's ringed, he's robed, he put, there's a gold chain put around him. His, notice the theme of all that, that richly uh, uh, ornamented uh, symbol of authority that is put on him once again. And he uh, is given a chariot, chariot, and he rides through Egypt, and the, the shout is, make way, the king, the ruler of Egypt is coming. So he's put in charge of all of Egypt. Only one is greater in all of Egypt, and that is Pharaoh. Isn't that amazing? Then it comes to uh, Joseph now. When the seven years he's stored up, and when the seven years of famine come, it says he begins to sell that grain to all the nations that come to Egypt to find bread. And he distributes bread to the nations, blesses the nations. Rulership, blessing of nations. Right? Wow, what an amazing thing. This is the reversal of withholding blessing. Then comes this great story here. And uh, uh, it's just so full of drama. Uh, we, we could spend a whole hour just on this one thing. But here now is a journey where the father sends the sons once again in the midst of the famine to Egypt to find bread. And they're sent that they might live and not die. That's an important emphasis in the text. Famine has gotten so bad that the father is going to send the sons all except one, he will not send Benjamin, going to send the sons to Egypt to find bread. When they get to Egypt, they arrive and they bow down before, Pharaoh, or before uh, Joseph, who's the ruler of Egypt. Does that fulfill destiny? They bow down. When Joseph sees them, he recognizes them but he does not disclose. He conceals the fact. He continues to talk to them in Egyptian with a translator. And he confronts them when he remembers his dreams. And he says to them, you guys are spies. You're not honest men. You've come to expose the nakedness of our land. There's a word there, the nakedness of the land. You've come to expose it. And the brothers say, oh no, we're not spies. And Joseph says then, give me three days. And on the third day, I will decide what I will do. So on the third day, they're brought in, and the test to find out whether or not they are true or spies, spies has the connotation of dishonest. Okay? You're, you're dishonest. And so on the third day, there's going to be a, 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 a test, and Joseph says to them, the test is this, you, you tell me you're a family of, uh, of uh, 11 brothers and one is no more, and one has been left with the father, I want you to go back and bring that younger brother, Benjamin, here to prove your words. But Reuben says, then, when they, when they hear this, it, it begins to uncover the angst that is in them now. And they begin to rehearse what they had done. And they, it's a great statement. Reuben says, We're, we must give an account for his blood. The one we sold into Egypt. This is why this is happening. 
And then it says that Joseph told uh, the, his servants to take the silver that they had bought to purchase bread and put it back in their sack and send them <laughs> secretly. <laughs> so they return. They've got silver in their sacks. And they stop for the night. And they open their sacks to get some of the bread to eat. And there's the silver. And it says, then they begin to tremble. And they begin to say, what is this that God has done? Because they fear now that if, if they, they fear uh, that Pharaoh could come after them. Okay? And they come back to the father and they, they tell what all had happened when they went. And the fact that now um, uh, Benjamin needs to be brought back to Egypt to prove their words that they're honest men. And the father is t he's in great grief because he does not want to lose his second son, Benjamin. The two sons to Rachel, Benjamin and Joseph, dear to his father in his old age. And Reuben then steps up and attempts to say, look, I will take full responsibility for him. But Jacob says, no, I will not let Benjamin go. So there's the first journey. Then comes the second. Well, let me say this. Think about the heart of the brothers. On the surface, they think they're very, very innocent. They've just come to get food. But underneath, they are very, very guilty. They've got debt. They've got payment that's required. And it's symbolized in the symbol the silver that's in their sack that they used to sell him into Egypt. That they bought, they thought, to gain. They sold him for silver. So they really are spies. They're not honest men. Okay, so it comes now to the second journey. The famine got worse, and finally Jacob... Uh, uh, and the brothers say, we've got to go back to Egypt. We've got to take Benjamin. We've got to go get more food. So the father, and, and at this point, Judah steps in and says, look, I will bear the blame. In, in fact, it's the words, I will take on the sin if I do not bring Benjamin back. Please release Benjamin that we might go. It's interesting, it's Judah who's going to take the, the, uh, the blame. And so the father says, okay, I will release him into your hands, Judah, and take a double portion. And then he says these words, may God grant you mercy before the man. May God grant you mercy in his eyes. So they arrive in Egypt. When Joseph sees them coming and sees that Benjamin his own close brother is with him. He says, take them to my house. Take them to my house. That's a great theme in this story. Bring them into my house. And when they hear this, being welcomed into the king's house, there's great fear that arises. And there's great fear because they've got silver that doesn't belong to them. And they fear that he's just going to bring him into their house to overpower them and judge them. And uh, Joseph says to his servants, go get uh, 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 slaughter a, a goat or something, I forget what it said, slaughter, let's eat. So you got this great theme of fellowship and welcoming on Joseph's part and the fear that's in their hearts that they're going to be overpowered, overruled, and judged, and so forth because of the silver in their sack. So Joseph returns to the house, and it says that they bowed down two times. 
there's that great word of destiny. Once again, they're bowing down before their brother. Joseph welcomes them into the house. Interestingly, when they sit down to the meal, and the Egyptians would not eat with the Hebrews, so Joseph would actually sit separate from his brothers. But he took his brothers and he lined them all up according to their age. Only Joseph would know that. And there they are, all lined up, and they look at one another and they say, how in the world does he know? And they sit down at table. Joseph, he, he, uh, uh, he leaves the room and weeps. He sees his, he sees his younger brother. Give, give that younger one five extra portions of the meal. He's still talking in Egyptian through a translator that they might not know. And then he said, after they've sat down at meal, eaten together, Joseph instructs his servants, send them on their way, fill their bags with bread, and put the silver back in their sack. And so there, the, the story, they, they, the silver is back in their sack, and they head back, and then Pharaoh... Uh, or Joseph then sends a servant after them to go and confront them. And on the way, uh, they're confronted and stopped. Why are you repaying uh, good with evil? And, uh, and uh, they say, oh, no, we're innocent. And then they said, prove it and open your sacks. And there they open all their sacks, and it gets down to the very last sack. And the last sack is Benjamin's. And Joseph is instructed not only put silver, but put my my cup in that sack of Benjamin. And there Benjamin has the, the cup in, in his sack. What is this that you have done? The brothers begin to say, uh, uh, Joseph says, uh, uh, the servant that, that has gone after, what is this that you have done? Can you prove your innocence? And the servants and, and the, the brothers begin to see that God has uncovered their guilt. And then Judah pleads when they're taken back to Joseph's house, pleads, uh, I'll bear the blame uh, because Joseph wants to, to take Benjamin and keep him. Imagine that in the eyes of the father. Okay. So we've run out of time here, but uh, they're finally taken back to, to uh, the father and uh, um, you got the, the great conclusion to the story then where uh, they're, when, they, when they're brought back to, to Joseph, Joseph then uh, reveals himself to his brothers two times. I am Joseph, your brother. I am Joseph, the brother, the one that you sold for silver into Egypt. But don't blame yourselves. Well, he says... Do not be distressed. Don't blame you. It doesn't say don't blame yourself. Do not be distressed. Do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. It was to save the lives that God sent me ahead of you. And this was a destiny that God had planned sovereignly through the whole thing. So you got that first going to Egypt, and it's, it's a covering of guilt. The second journey is guilt is exposed. Third journey, guilt is uncovered and forgiven in the eyes of Joseph. Of Joseph. So the conclusion to the story, the destiny of rulership and the means by which that will happen will be rejection through brothers, sold for silver, robe is dipped in blood, falsely accused, imprisoned, forgotten. But then he's remembered. He's brought out of prison. He's robed, ringed, he blesses nation. Silver's returned. He's welcomed, and they're welcomed and forgiven, and his identity is disclosed. There is the revelation of the Son that's coming, and how the destiny will be fulfilled. Amen? Amen. Okay, we've got to get out of this room very, very quick. So I won't even pray. Just go. <laughs> <laughs>